Hello and welcome to another video in this series as we journey from the simple properties of the primes to the foothills of the Riemann hypothesis. Today is a very short video looking at the gaps between primes and will show or prove quite an interesting and quite surprising result. So let's dive in. So just to set the context, in the previous videos um, we've seen that the primes can't be really thinly spread out because the sum of the inverse primes converges. If they were very thinly spread out, like say the square numbers, then that sum would converge, so they can't, they're not so thinly spread out. The second thing that's related actually is that we've also seen that the density of the primes is 1 over log x and that leads into the prime number theorem but we previously talked about how Gauss um, s developed this idea based on experimental evidence that he saw. The result is actually, the prime number theorem is actually proven now so we can say with much more confidence that the density of primes is approximately 1 over log x around the number x. So with these constraints that they can't be so thinly spread out and there is a sort of a finite density of primes, it suggests that the gaps between primes must be constrained in some sense. Um, so that's an interesting question to ask. So let's, let's find out, let's dive in. And before we do dive in, we're just going to remind ourselves of a very simple mathematical um, function called a factorial. You very likely come across it at um, school or elsewhere, but let's just remind ourselves. So the factorial of a whole number is the product of all the numbers from 1 up to that n and it's written with um, an exclamation mark like this, sort of like a surprise. <laughs> so n factorial is n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 all the way down to 3 times 2 times 1. So for example, 4 factorial is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which is 24. You can see actually these factorials grow really quickly because 5 factorial is 5 times all of that and 10 factorial is quite a big number. Um, the other thing which is I guess obvious in some sense is these are definitely not prime because they are by definition products of other numbers, whole numbers. Um, there are some exceptions which are the very small ones so um, 2 factorial is 2 times 1 which is 2, 1 factorial and 0 factorial but apart from those um, which you know, those are small enough to hide as it were, um, for n more than 2 they are not prime. So let's um, look at an interesting sequence that we can build from factorials. What we'll do is we'll look at an example one now, uh, we might look at another one as well and we'll kind of generalize from it. So the pattern is that we look at a sequence of numbers starting from 5 factorial plus 2 all the way up to 5 factorial plus 5. So it's 5 factorial plus 2, 5 factorial plus 3, 5 factorial plus 4, 5 factorial plus 5. So it's 2, 3, 4, four. So it's four numbers really in this small sequence. Um, but let's look at them. And we can see that the first one, this one here, is divisible by 2. And we can write that out. We can sort of write it out as a product of two factors, two times this thing is this, because two times one is two, and two times this thing is that. This might be really obvious, you might be able to see it straight away, because five factorial is five times four times three times two times one, so it contains a two in there. And similarly, we can say that five factorial plus three is divisible by 3 because 3 is divisible by 3 and 5 factorial contains a 3 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 so this is just writing out those um, factors so we can see that 
2 is a factor of 5 factorial plus 2, 3 is a factor of this, 4 is a factor of this, 5 is a factor of this. That means none of these are prime. And that means this whole sequence from 5 factorial plus 2 up to 5 factorial plus 5 is prime free. There are no primes in that sequence. It's a short sequence, but we've constructed it in this roundabout way to be by design, to be free of primes. Let's just do that by hand in case it wasn't clear. So we've written 5 factorial plus 2 equals 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 plus 2. Now is that divisible by 2? Can we divide that by 2? Well we can because that divides by 2 easily and this divides by 2. And we can do the same again. 5 factorial plus 3 equals 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 plus 3 and we can see straight away that there's a 3 in there and a 3 in there so that when we divide by 3 it cancels neatly without a remainder. And we can see we can do that all the way up to well we can do it for each of these numbers in the factorial. We can do it for 2, we can do it for 3, we can do it for 4, we can do it for 5. So that's the pattern to spot. And with that same method and that same pattern, we can construct any um, sequence of the form n factorial plus 2 up to n factorial plus n and say that it is prime free. Let's again, let's write that out. So we've seen the example with 5. So now let's write it with a general n plus, I don't know, let's call it a number m. So that's n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 all the way down to 3 to 2 to 1 plus m. And we're going to say, is that divisible by m? Well, as long as m well, is in here somewhere, this will cancel neatly because this will be cancelling without remainder and as long as m is 2, 3, all the way up to n we can say it will divide. So if m, m is 3, that'll do. If m is, I don't know, n minus 2, that'll do. If m is n, that'll do, but it can't be greater than n. So that means the sequence n plus 2 all the way up to n plus n, that sequence it has no primes in it. I hope that's clear. It's best to actually write it out with pen and pencil yourself to see the dynamics of this um, cancelling process and to see how it can be generalised. So. The interesting thing there is that sequence then from n factorial plus 2 up to n factorial plus n, that's a sequence of length n minus 1. And remember n could be anything now, it could be 10, could be 100, could be a million, could be a trillion, could be anything. And therefore this prime free sequence can be as large as we like. If n is 100, that sequence has a length 99. If n is a million, then it's a million minus 1. And this means that there's no limit on the sequence that is prime free. So actually, without even um, thinking too hard about it, we've proved that there is no upper limit on prime gaps. So that's really easy. Um, we almost kind of uh, didn't realise we proved it until we <laughs> until we'd already proved it. Um, so that's a really nice, easy proof. Um, we can think about that now a little bit. You know, what's the meaning of this? What can we interpret from this? So we started by saying that the primes can't be too sparse. That's what we started with, and we had good reasons for saying that. 
But now we've concluded actually there's no upper limit on the gaps between primes. Can we reconcile those two facts? We can as long as the large prime gaps, you know, if the gaps are the larger ones, if they're rare, they need to be rare in order for the average density to catch up. So they can't be common, otherwise the density which we've already established, 1 over log x, um, the average, you know, will be wrong. Um, so yes, we can reconcile those two positions as long as the large prime gaps are rare. So that makes us think about, well, you know, how common are they and how common are medium-sized gaps and how common are small-sized gaps? So let's think about the distribution of prime gaps. So this is a little experiment I did. It's you know, numerically done. Um, so for the first 500 million numbers, so from 1 all the way up to 500 million, we can count, or we can get a computer to count, um, the sizes of the gaps between primes and keep account of them, see how often they occur. And we can see, well, we can see that actually um, there's an interesting pattern emerging here. It's quite strong. Um, this isn't as scattered as I had expected. It's quite tightly um, defined, which is quite surprising. Um, and what it says, the first thing we see is that because this kind of chart, this line almost goes down with gap, it says the larger the gap, the rarer those prime gaps are, so there's less of them. For smaller gaps, we can see that they occur more often. Remember, this is a log count. Um, just and that, that, that by, by taking the log of the count, we get a straight line. Now, there's an outlier here, which is a gap of one, and that's just the only one which is between prime two and prime three. The difference is one. Uh, other than that, we never see a prime gap of size one ever again because all the other primes always have an even number between them. We can see that prime gaps of size 2, 3, 4 occur quite often. We can see that medium-sized gaps occur medium often. So that's interesting, um, and I guess in some ways that matches intuition. Um, for me, it wasn't obvious that medium-sized gaps would occur more often than very small, less often than very small size gaps. Um, that's just you know different experiences and different intuitions. But this this kind of makes it clear. You can do this chart yourselves for different um, number ranges, and you'll see that this kind of line is preserved. It's not mathematical proof, but it's um, numerical evidence in support of um, a hypothesis, <laughs> uh, which we'll have to prove some in some other way. So this isn't proof, but it's strong numerical evidence. Just like we did when we looked at um, the distribution of primes and the number of primes below a, below a, below a, below a number. So let's summarize what we've um, picked out from that distribution. The overall shape is really linear, and that's um, um, that should pique our interest. Uh, to me, it's surprising, um, but it should certainly pique our interest. And it's quite tightly defined which means there's something going on um, about the kind of the arithmetic of, of the primes that's keeping that um, distribution fairly tightly defined. Um, and we should explore that. We should dig into why that is. Um, <clears throat> and personally for me, I think it's really interesting that actually there are gaps above and below that line. In this region above the line and below the line, there are no dots which means that the gap, the prime gaps don't occur in numbers to be placed there. That, I think that's interesting. So there's an exclusion going on um, <clears throat> that's worth kind of looking into. I think overall it's worth saying that um, the state of mathematics today is, is such that we can't precisely describe that distribution in a simple form just like the primes themselves, they're just beyond the reach of mathematics today. 
it's um, certainly become a rich um, area of research and the research, the state of the art is looking at questions within that broad um, area of prime gaps. So it might look at just large gaps or just small gaps or you know other slices of that problem. But overall, it's not a solved area. And just to kind of clarify in case you spotted this uh, difference, <laughs> what we talked about earlier was prime sequence, prime free sequences. And what we're talking about here is prime gaps. And, and they are the same thing in some sense, but there is an accepted definition that the gap at the, the nth prime is the difference between the next prime and that prime. So it's the difference between primes. And that's a, that, that's, that doesn't make a big difference, but um, it means that you know, the gap between three and five is two. So looking back actually at that um, distribution, we can see, yes, we saw that smaller um, gaps occur more often. And we can almost, but not quite say that the gap of two occurs um, the most. It doesn't quite on this one. Um, it, it certainly occurs more than most other gap sizes. In this chart, it's two, three, four, I think occurs the most, but that might not hold forever. You know, if we did a different number range, um, a different gap might take the lead roughly and change again and so on. In fact, you can see that you can find animations on the internet um, showing um, different ones taking the lead, but certainly two, the gap of two occurs much more than a gap of 150 or a gap of 200 or, or larger gaps. So we can ask, well, how often does a gap of two occur? And if you've kind of just even in passing um, looked at primes, you'll have noticed, um, you know, that the twins seem to pop up. Um, we've seen three and five, five and seven, 11, 13, and so on. And, and that doesn't stop, that doesn't kind of um, dwindle out, that doesn't sort of fizzle out and fade away. Even further along the number line, you'll see twin primes that differ just by two, so 101, 103, 107, 109. So it's, you can ask the question, do they go on forever? And there is a twin prime conjecture, very famous conjecture, that says, yes, they do go on forever that there are an infinite number of twin primes. Now, that again is another example of a very simple statement that anyone can understand, but we, you know, it's beyond our ability to prove it correct or not. Um, and if you can, you know, that you'll be world famous. <laughs> um, but it's amazing, isn't it? Again, the primes seem to have properties which are very accessible and understandable in terms of posing the question we can explain and understand what a twin prime is and we can ask, do they carry on forever? And we can see numerically that they seem to, but we just can't prove it. So next time we'll um, carry on um, looking at prime gaps as a sort of part two of this video and we'll explore a different approach to um, primes. We'll look at probabilistic models probabilistic ways of describing primes to see if those models can give us interesting results and you know our initial thought might be that because they're probabilistic they have to be simplified in some sense compared to reality but we'll see actually um, they can still produce things that are um, interesting results that appear to match reality and therefore it's quite a nice tool for creating conjectures. So we'll leave that for next time. See you next time. Bye.